It's Mike here, and today, women's hormone replacement therapy. The FDA just very recently announced that they are lifting the black box warning, the this could cause breast cancer warning for women's hormone replacement therapy. I feel like this is a very big win for women and for women's health. And as somebody with a master of public health, this is super interesting to me, not just what has occurred in terms of the announcement, but how it occurred, how they went around the normal protocol for coming to a conclusion like this, as well as just the health issue itself, whether we're talking about breast cancer risk for different types of hormone replacement therapy combinations, as well as other disease and mortality risks. Additionally to how nuanced this whole thing is, because there's parts that I agree with, there's parts that I don't agree with, there's conflicts of interest, but then I'm agreeing with them in certain cases, so let's just go. Yes, I am a little bit nasally coming off a seasonal bug right now. I'm sorry if it's annoying. And now maybe you're fixating on it even more, I'm sorry. Anyway, in the area of women's health, I have done an endometriosis video, a PCOS video, even a female erectile dysfunction video. And I sort of get a, why are you talking about this from a few people, but a lot of people are like, hey, it's cool to just see a guy talk about this. So hopefully this is welcomed. Let's get to the background. And I will say that this has been celebrated largely as a win for women's health because there's been a ton of just blunders in women's health medicine history in terms of getting them the treatment they need, researching the things that need to be researched compared to men's health. And I'll say, I was sitting with my mom at lunch a few weeks back and being like, hey, I've been looking at this research on hormone replacement therapy and it looks like it could be beneficial unlike what we've been told in the past. And I was like, hey, talk to your doctor about this. I was basically like a walking pharmaceutical ad. <laughs> I was like, try hormone replacement therapy today. And that was based off a couple of studies finding lower mortality for people who at least started it within a 10 year window of menopause. So it depends on the person's situation, but we're talking about roughly 10 to 30% lower mortality for those. Yes, this meta-analysis of five randomized controlled trials found 30% lower risk of death during the study period. However, that's just one piece of the puzzle. We got more pieces of the puzzle coming. But then yeah, fast forward to a few days ago and the FDA's announcement comes. And the FDA is removing black box warnings from hormone replacement therapy products for menopause. And this is where we need to get to a little bit of the nuance for the background, and that is that hormone replacement therapy can look a lot different depending on the type. We have main ones like estrogen only, but then the combined therapy of estrogen plus progesterone. And then we have topical ones as well as oral ones and patches, et cetera. And the important thing here is that those all have different risk profiles. Something that is just topical is not gonna be increasing estrogen levels in the body as much, for example, which changes the mechanisms. But yeah, so we have the FDA coming out and people who were on the panel that they put together saying, hey, this has been a big blunder. We had a study in 2002 that was like, we see increased breast cancer risk here. They even stopped it early. And then the next year they put a breast cancer warning on these replacement therapies. So now for 22 years, women have been afraid of taking these hormone replacement therapies on the grounds of breast cancer, which is of course the number one most common gender specific cancer for women. Yeah, for 22 years, they were dissuaded from buying it a bit like having that cancer warning label on cigarettes. Of course, we're talking about two totally different things and risk profiles, but still. And then I would also add that the WHO got in on the action as they love to having estrogen only as an endometrial cancer, class 1A carcinogen, and then for combined that estrogen plus progesterone therapy, having a class 1A carcinogen status for breast cancer. Two studies in the early 2000s claimed HRT was associated with major risks, including higher risk of breast cancer. But the FDA commissioner says that was, quote, one of the greatest mistakes in modern medicine. And the FDA commissioner, Dr. McCary, says he wasn't convinced after that 2002 study. Later, once the data was published, some of us looked at it and said, this is interesting. There's no statistical significance in the increase in breast cancer. If we don't have statistics, then we don't have science. All of a sudden, snake oil cures diseases and science goes out the women, out the window. That was a great slip there. This is a little bit worrying as well because that original finding was actually statistically significant. I had to check it like 10 times. The confidence interval overlaps with one and therefore it is. And this leads me to believe that Either they don't know what they're talking about, he's mixing things around, or something is going on. Interestingly, this is why they actually stopped the study. They hit a trigger point for breast cancer risk, and that was the end of it. Here's where 
I feel like we got to get into the nuance because there's a 2002 study and then there's of course all of the studies that have happened since then. And simply asking in a neutral fashion about the relationship between breast cancer and female hormone replacement therapy to consensus, which compiles a bunch of research, they're still saying, uh, yeah, there is an increased risk. And since 2002, we've had the Million Women study, which found an increase for that combined therapy as well. And we have a 2019 meta-analysis that also found the same increased risk. And no clinical trial has ever shown that HRT increases the risk of breast cancer mortality. Weirdly, he also missed that we do have studies like this one in JAMA, actually a women's health initiative follow-up that have found increased risk of breast cancer mortality, statistically significantly as well. However, there's a huge distinction for the combined therapy for breast cancer, again, versus the estrogen only. When we're talking about estrogen only, we're seeing in some cases even a lower risk profile as this study found which looking to consensus again, we can see this very mixed picture compared to the combined therapy. Women who took estrogen alone had a 24% reduction in breast cancer. And this is where it gets annoying because a major reason they add the progesterone to the estrogen to make the combined therapy is that that lowers the risk of endometrial cancer. So it's frustrating and we can't win here, it seems. And in fact, the endometrial cancer warnings remain on these products with the FDA. So we have this annoying disparity between the types of therapy. I would add that the creams, like the vaginal creams, we're seeing no increased risk there for vaginal estrogen. That again, makes sense mechanistically. I had m multiple times in my clinical practice where I would prescribe something like vaginal estrogen, safe, efficacious, really almost no systemic absorption. She goes to the pharmacy, she gets her medication, she gets home, she opens that warning, and she's terrified and calls me in a panic. And I think now we can replace panic with precision. But this is where we need to put the whole picture back in because even if we are still seeing some degree of increased risk of breast cancer for that combined therapy, we are seeing decreased risks of a lot of things. Again, we're talking about decreased mortality for certain windows as well as decreased heart disease risk, which might be because of estrogen's positive effects on vascular function, elasticity of your arteries. But we're seeing a reduction in cardiovascular risk and even improvements in cognitive abilities later on in life, showing us that treating menopause can help patients more than just making them fearful of a key treatment. Major increase in quality of life, even potentially mental symptoms as well. And then of course, those menopausal symptoms like hot flashes, which I will get to in a bit, and that's where diet does come in later on. So I hope everybody's watched to at least this point and didn't stop watching after talking about the breast cancer risk. But then the question becomes, how did the FDA come to this conclusion? Do they have a massive committee of experts methodically comb through all of the research that exists and then come to a conclusion? Nope. See, that is what they normally do with an advisory committee. And they have other hoops, like for example, an ethical conflicts of interest search on the people who are going to be on the committee. But no, they decided to just do an expert panel for this one because it was more efficient, because it was less bureaucratic and more efficient as they say. Um, it, the advisory committees are long, expensive, bureaucratic, and they have a long lead time. But we can, I think, get good public feedback and public comment in other ways. We're trying to move faster than the typical government process. Normally they have a public call for nominations, but in this case, we don't really know how people ended up on this expert panel. And we have some somewhat sketchy connections to industry. In bypassing the normal conflicts of interest screening, while they didn't add pharma execs directly, we do have panel members who make money on courses about how to administer hormone replacement therapy, for example. And I recently did a Make America Healthy Again RFK Junior video, and this is where you know RFK's FDA is looking different. You know, he's been ripping apart panels. We don't know if you could buy your way onto this panel. I'm just gonna hope that you can't. And why does this disturb me a little bit? Because RFK could just go ahead and say, hey, we're gonna do an expert panel on seed oils where he just handpicks people and then goes, we need to put a toxic label on all seed oil containing products. <laughs> When we know from studies like this one on 500,000 people that the risk with even canola oil for death is lower than butter, which is something that he advocates for, along with beef tallow. You know, he might just throw the beef tallow people 
on that expert panel. And now I just really briefly wanna talk about where diet can play a role because a lot of this quality of life aspect that people are advocating for has to do with those hot flashes. And we do have this study by Dr. Neil Bernard, a randomized control trial that gave people soybeans diet. He also put them on a whole food plant-based diet. And the results were a decrease of 88% of moderate to severe hot flashes within the intervention group compared to a 34% decrease in the control group. And what is this showing? It's showing that some of the negative effects could be from diet and lifestyle. And that is something that should also be talked about at the same time if we're just trying to solve this issue. Additionally, we are looking at an artery benefit of a whole food vegan diet too. So we have an overlap in benefits. So in the end, I once again want to emphasize the nuance here. They removed the label for breast cancer on all of the products, including the combined ones that still have an increased risk. Is that necessarily completely causal? We're not sure, but in terms of those, not all that much has changed. We have more information for the estrogen only ones. It looks like that's not causing breast cancer, but still as they have labeled from the FDA causing endometrial cancer, but all of it once again, likely dwarfed by the other benefits. So perhaps this is a situation where if somebody's at high risk for breast cancer, they need to be thinking extra hard about this. But for the rest of the population, the scale is looking like we're gonna see lower mortality risk for certain groups, as well as a lower cardiovascular disease risk, et cetera. And we're gonna potentially see those quality of life benefits, which again, can also be seen with dietary interventions like that soybean whole food plant-based diet of Neil Bernard. And then finally, Perhaps my biggest gripe and motivation for making this video largely was that they just took the traditional advisory panel aspect and they just made an expert panel instead, which was chosen in a non-transparent fashion and had industry connected people on it. I just think it should have been done better, even if they came to the same result. Anyway, let me know down below what you think about all of this. It's a very complicated, heated topic. Flashes of heat are involved, and but also very important. So I hope that we can, but also a very important one. So yeah, also feel free to like, subscribe and all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.